The Z8 is coming to market. There are lots of things that we've been speculated on, the specs that have come out, but no one knows for sure exactly what's going on. So today I want to spend some time and talk about what I would like to see from the Z8 camera in a comparison to my own Sony A7R5 and the Canon R5, two cameras in which everyone says this camera needs to compete with. I'll also add some information about the Canon R5C, which I think this camera should go up against as well. So without further ado, let's dive into the video. Before we get started, let me take a moment to say thanks to everyone who's been watching the video. If you've come here for content and you like what you've seen, give the video a thumbs up. If you're not yet subscribed, please get subscribed. In addition, I also have links to products that I've used in the description area. So if you guys are interested in buying something, please click on one of those links. By clicking the link, I'll earn a small commission and you'll be helping the channel to grow. All right, let's get back to the video. So Nikon Z9, the camera that the Z8 is supposed to be based upon, has been a tour de force when it comes to technology. There are a lot of people nowadays, and it's younger folks really, who think that Nikon is a no-name company, some old company, or maybe some new company coming out there. So when it comes to video, Nikon is a bit behind. Both Canon and Sony have been making camcorders for years. Whether it's a broadcast or movie production, they've had a foot in these industries for a very long time. Nikon is more on the photography side. So while Nikon has made some mirrorless cameras, they have not been at the same level as what Canon and Sony have been doing. I'm not gonna talk about the other guys at this juncture. I'm gonna focus more on Sony and Canon because we know that Panasonic and Fuji also have been in the video space for some time. When the Z9 came out, all the specifications that came to market was certainly something that made it a flagship camera and something to be considered. On the folder side, 20 frames per second on the RAW, or it can go up to 120 frames per second when it comes to JPEG. With further firmware updates, this camera keeps improving. They've added 30 frames per second as a medium level format for recording. And a lot of photographers like to have these extra features on hand. Now this camera is geared mainly towards professionals. But of course, based on the price point of $5,500, there have been a lot of non-professionals been buying this camera. In the past year, we've seen a few videos from content creators that start to recognize that the video features on this camera are so awesome that it deserves some attention. If you ask most of the younger folks that would like, Nikon, what's that? Video? Ah. Because yes, most of us have known that there's a Z6 and a Z7, and those are mainly the cameras that we knew that Nikon had as far as a hybrid camera that does video. But when the Z9 came out, everything changed. So here we are, about a year and a half since the release, and we're now looking at the Z8. Most of us would have loved to have the Z6 III come out, but Nikon decided to go another route and bring out the Z8. Back in 2020, we got the Canon R5. This camera was a really good camera, it can record all the way up to 8K, however, it had some overheating issues. In 2021, Canon came out with the R5C. So this camera has a fan built on it, also records 8K, but can record 8K for pretty much an unlimited amount of time. Sony has come out with the A7S 3 but that only goes to 4K. Then they put out the FX3, also 4K. Now, we're gonna not Sony because Sony has production cameras that can record at a higher level. But those things are really expensive and not for hybrid shooters. The closest thing we can say is the A7R5. Now this camera has video up to 8K 24 frames per second. There's also the A1, but that's a couple years old, but that can record up to 8K 30. $6,500, so that's at a whole other level. It's kind of close to that R5C, but because it has insufficient cooling, we can't really compare it to the R5C. And it's mainly a photo focus camera with some good video capabilities. It is their flagship camera, much like the Z9 is. So we can say that at the same level, they should be similar. It's 50 megapixel versus 45 on the Z9. So yeah. 
they're not too far off. But the Z9 is put in a pro body while the Sony gave you a camera and then you have a battery grip. On the professional side, Canon and Nikon, when you're talking about pro cameras, you don't get a separate battery grip. It's a built-in all-in-one body. Most professionals probably go to Canon or Nikon when it comes to something to use for photography, just because of the built-in grip and the extended battery. Now, not to say that Sony is not a professional camera. It is because some professionals do utilize that camera. But again, a pro body and a photo side, something with a built-in grip. So here we are, back in 22, seeing a host of cameras being released. I'm gonna talk video side right now, because the photo side, you know, pretty much, there's a lot of features there that already have been coming up and this minute improvements over time. When mirrorless came out, mirrorless gave a lot of cameras a big boost. Nikon took that to the next level by saying, hey, we can take out the shutter, because now we have a sensor with a really fast readout that we don't need a shutter to do the work. So that has really taken photo capabilities to the next step and also given them an edge when it came to video. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, the highest ISO isn't high enough and so on. Most people are gonna record videos at the highest ISO. Amateurs do that. If you're recording video for anything for production, you're gonna use your own light. So I'm not gonna focus on how high the ISO is and so on and so forth, because specs is not the end of the story. And most people who are looking at specs only, they're people that don't really utilize the camera for what the real purposes are. That's more like a bragging rights kind of thing. Utilizing it in its proper ISO range to get good quality video, you need proper lights. Okay, so let's leave out the high level specs thing out of the way. It has good capabilities. It goes up to 25, 600 ISO, not 51.2 like the other cameras. But again, those who are utilizing the camera know how to use it and get the best result from it. All right, so we'll leave that alone. As far as what it can do, it's excellent for video and for photo capabilities. One of the things that people look forward to today when it comes to camera is whether this camera has a really good autofocusing system and how good is the stabilization if you want to do handheld work. Now we can say it doesn't really matter for professionals because they're going to put it on a gimbal or some kind of rig and also they're going to shoot manual. With that, the autofocus side is satisfied because again, you're pulling manual pulls and you're taking care of that. You don't really care about the autofocus. And as far as stability, you're going to be on some kind of stable platform or have some kind of gimbal that will aid in stability. But for those of us who are not doing a big production and you want to do something pretty decent and have good autofocus and good stability, you're looking for a product that can give you all of that in one body. Sadly, hybrid cameras is what we end up with. We have to work with these technologies because that's what we have. Unless you're Sony who have now purpose-built bodies in the FX3 and the FX30 to satisfy the video content creator's needs. This camera, for those of us who still want to do photography, it's a pretty good camera. The screen is one of my favorite thing on this camera because it flips out. It, well, it, first of all, the tilt side, it pulls away from the body, you can tilt it, and then you can flip it out. You can turn it around. If you're recording yourself, that's something that's very useful, okay? Now, what I like about this camera is for those days that I don't feel like I need to be able to flip it out and look at it and I wanna do my, my photography days and look straight down the barrel of the camera, I can flip the screen out. Just tilt it up. No, I should show you guys from this way. This is it flush against the body, okay? If I flip it up, I can see, it's kind of like a waist down type of shooting. Pull it out a little bit to give me some more view and that's fine. So I can stand there and I can take a video. It looks like I'm shooting a photo using um, a Mamiya, one of those other cameras, but it's, it's there. If I want to shoot and I want to go low, I like to be able to flip the screen out. Okay. And now I can twist it around and let's say I'm doing a portrait. Here's a screen. I can have it down like this and I can see what I'm doing. If I get low on the ground and I really need to see what I'm doing, I want to tilt it at a different angle. Don't know why I put it all the way down there. If I'm low on the ground and I want to tilt it at a different angle, I can flip it out this way and I can utilize that. 
So there is a lot of functionality to this screen that sometimes us photographers will you know, look at these cameras and say, I don't want to flip out the screen. Once you've had this multi-angle screen, you start to realize that all cameras should have this screen because it's fantastic. It helps in both photo and video use. This camera shoots 61 megapixels. The Z8 is gonna shoot at 45 megapixels. They're not that far off, so it's not too crazy a thought process, right? When it comes to video, while this camera is nice and compact, 4K is probably the most you wanna shoot with it. You can shoot 8K, because you've seen some of my videos that I've posted are 8K recorded with this camera, and the quality is pretty good. The one thing you have to keep in mind when you're shooting 8K is that you can't do long shoots because the camera will overheat. Here in Thailand where I am, if I shoot for a long period of time with this camera, I start to get heat warning on it. And that's 8K. That's when we're talking 8K. The Z9 can do two hours of 8K 30 internally. That is awesome. If we look at the size of what the Z8 should be, it's very similar to the D850 of the past. The numbers we've seen as far as uh, the height, width, and depth matches very closely to that camera. In my mind, that should give us a good amount of recording time at 8K30. The next thing that the Z9 does is also allow you to do internal RAW. And then we can record RAW internally at up to 8.3K. That's a high codec and not many cameras can do that internally. They usually offload raw recording to an external recorder. So that way your camera doesn't have to heat up. Now, when we talk about the R5, the R5 can do up to 8K30 for about 45 minutes. When you talk about the R5C, because there's a built-in fan, it's almost unlimited. Provided you're not in a really hot scenario, you can record for a long period of time on that camera. We don't know if the Z8 is gonna come with an external fan. If Nikon doesn't give an external fan, well, hopefully we can get about an hour recording out of it, just utilizing the body that it has. But I'd like to see it go longer, because if you are saying, we wanna focus this camera on content creators, people who don't wanna to spend tons of money on a expensive camera, but they wanna record 8K, well, you can get it in the Z8 and do a great amount of recording with it. Not similar to the Z9 because of course it doesn't have a fan and the body is smaller, but you're supposed to get good quality from it. There's some people who say, who needs 8K? 8K is too much. There's no screen out there that you can use to um, view 8K videos on. That's not the whole point. Because 8K, you can basically crop it into 4K or you can down sample the image down to 4K and have a really good image quality that you can use on a 4K TV. There are 12K cameras out there. People are like, you won't need that. The image quality again is what we're talking about. And the more that you can compress into a smaller format, the better the quality overall. So why are people buying six to $5,000 or whatever it is that the red cost? I forgot the actual numbers, 35 and up for these cameras. Those are movie production cameras, but yes, at the end of the day, the quality is what matters. And if you can get that quality down to 4K for a reasonable price, why wouldn't you care about that? Taking these things in mind, we know that the Z8 has to be able to stand up to what's on the market today, plus what's coming in the future. I doubt Nikon is gonna put out a camera that's going to be obsolete within a few months after it comes out. In tech, we say once your stuff is released, it's already obsolete which is kind of true because tech is always marching forward. So by the time you have come up with something great and you put it out to market, you're already working on something else in the background that's gonna come in the future. And everybody else in your competition is coming out there with something that's gonna be very competitive, very close to it, or better than it. The way you can make things better is firmware updates. And people are always holding back tech to see what the competition is doing so that they can add it later on and keep the camera fresh. So in my mind, if the Z8 doesn't come with these technologies that's gonna beat the R5 and the R5C and this A7 V and the Canon A1, then it's not gonna be something that most people are gonna want. Now, let me take a step back and say this. When it comes to image stabilization, 
the Canon does up to eight stops with image stabilized lens. And based upon this list, from what you're seeing, there's a particular lens that says needs a firmware update, but it's at six stops. So let's take that and say the Canon does six stops. So let's use it as a guide and say, as far as what the Canon R5 can do, that's six stops based upon its internal IBIS. This camera says it's eight stops with a 50 millimeter 1.2 lens. A 50 millimeter 1.2 lens from Sony is not an image stabilized lens. I've shot video with this lens, the 24 to 105 OSS lens. And when I've shot the video walking around with this lens, it comes out to be very stable. Now, depending on how I walk, because I'm not doing the ninja walk to make it you know, look really good, just doing normal walking, I see that the footage looks pretty good. Sony has Catalyst Browse, and when you take the thing in Catalyst Browse, it's like a next level, and it just makes everything smooth. You've seen Panasonic's videos. You know what the Panasonic stabilization looks like, right? That looks awesome. The next level thing is now the Sony ZV-E1. They've taken the stability of the R5 to the next level. And that thing looks like it's on a gimbal when you're utilizing it. There is something that kind of bums me out because when the camera got released, I'm pretty sure this camera can do the same thing. But what I've been hearing is that Sony is not very good when it comes to firmware updates. So they haven't done it for the A1. They have not now done it for the R5. They haven't done it for this camera we recorded on the FX30. The FX30 has really good stabilization. That's the reason why I got it. Wouldn't you know about it? a week later, they announced this camera. Stabilization is even better. Active stabilization. So eight stops in the body. That's fantastic. Stabilized lens makes it even more. Now they've done something. I don't have to assume it's software to make it even better And the ZV-E1. Why can't we have it here? And in my mind, Nikon has to do that on the Z8 to really top everybody else. Come on, a point and shoot is like, I don't even know what it stops and I even look at the specs on it yet. But if this is eight stops without any stabilized lens and I put this lens on it, there's no specification that tells me, you know, what that gives you. So I don't have anything to show you, but my feeling is that, is it 10 stops? I don't know. It's It looks fantastic, that's all I can say. I think the Z8 will get that. If it does, and it's on par with this camera or on par with the ZV-E1, yeah, we have a big winner on hand at that point, especially when it comes to video. The photo guys will do great as well. I've taken photos with this camera at 1.5 seconds handheld, or one fifth of a second, sorry, handheld, and got a pretty good shot at it at nighttime, okay? So I've also put it on a, a wall and taken a four second shot, that doesn't look too bad. The images that I'm showing you right now are some of these things that I've taken. So you can see what I'm talking about. I've done some mild adjustment on it, so you can see that. The images that I'm showing you are gonna be the ones without any adjustments and then with some adjustments. They look pretty stable. I couldn't see any shake in them. So that's pretty darn good. I'm excited based upon what I've been seeing in the performance of the A7R5. I think that Nikon is going to tweak that camera even more to make it better. And I think Sony is waiting to tweak the camera up. They're probably already working on it to match that ZV-E1. If Nikon comes out of the box matching that little camera, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of people going out to buy it. Of course, not everybody wants to spend $4,000 on a camera. In my mind, that's probably what it's going to be. I keep saying two. I'll say it again. I think one is going to be a photo owner camera, being in the price range of about $3,400. And the other one for the video focus one is probably going to end up being $3,900. But we'll see. If they give us one camera with everything inside of it, then I think we'll get everything that we need on the photo side and the video side. Now, some photographers are going to say, well, I have to pay extra for all these features that I don't need. But again, Nikon needs a win. We need something that's going to do well for both sides. And if it's only in one body like the Z9, it'd be fantastic for Nikon to move forward. 
But I think the smarter thing to do is to make two bodies like everybody's been doing. One photo focus, one video focus. The photo focus version will have video in it, but it won't have raw. All right, I'm ending the video here. Again, if you like what I'm saying, give the video a thumbs up. If you look at my equipment that I've used and you're interested in something to purchase, use my links below. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.